So for the first learning module of chapter six, we'll look at the basics of trusses. And I said, I know I said that the majority of the learning modules would actually just be example problems, but probably for all of the chapters that we have left, I'll do at least one five to 10 minute video to just introduce some key concepts from the chapter. So I'm sure that you're all familiar with trusses, either from going up in your own attic and looking at and maybe wondering how the actual weight of your roof and all the roof and material, both the underlayment along with the shingles, along with uh, everything else that might be on top, not much down here, but if you're in the north, maybe things like snow, how all of that weight is actually transferred down to the ground in order to be supported. And maybe you've seen a bunch of maybe two by fours that are nailed together and they look something like this figure down here on the lower right, uh, that's a truss. And you've probably seen that same type of structure used in other civil engineering applications for things like bridges. So all that a truss is, is an interconnection of these very slender, what are known as members, and the members generally speaking can be metal or they can be wood, and they are going to be connected together at points that we will refer to as joint. And what the book means by slender is that we can actually ignore the width of these members. We're only going to be concerned about their length from an analysis point of view. And the key thing you need to know is when these are deployed in the real world, in civil engineering applications like roofs or bridges, you have additional structural elements that will actually serve to transfer the load to the joints of the trusses. So here in the upper right, you see for a roof type application, they're referring to this member that runs along the length of the roof as a purlin. And what that is doing is it's taking all of the weight of the roof and transferring it to the joints of the truss. So you, what they're trying to emphasize here is when we do analysis problems in this section uh, and we have something that looks like the figure in the lower right, that this would actually correspond to a real physical use case where we have a three-dimensional scenario and these trusses kind of sit at cross sections and you have some type of additional structural, structural element that's transferring the load to the joints. So uh, one thing to know that's important as well, probably not surprising to you, when you actually have these trusses supported, since they're oftentimes employed in very high loading conditions that are highly variable. Again, think about the snow on the roof example that I did up north. If you think about how much the magnitude of the loading changes between the summer and winter, that just the magnitude of the loading is going to change dramatically. In addition, uh, often maybe down here, maybe more pronounced than up there, you would have environmental conditions that are going to cause expansion and contraction. So you don't want these to be over constrained at their supports. So we will traditionally use or model them in this class as being rocker or roller type connections that are going to give them a little wiggle room as the loading or environmental conditions change. Uh, here you can see basically in a truss utilized in a bridge, going back to the previous slide, uh, based upon the uh, structural members that are used to transfer the load to the joints of the truss. When we talk about a roof truss, traditionally the forces will be applied at the interconnections which are on the top. In a bridge, it actually works the opposite way as these stringers and floor beams transfer the load associated with the asphalt, uh, assuming it's an asphalt road, along with the cars and trucks that drive over to the actual joints. So that's just showing you that although they look the same, the um, kind of way that they're constructed will result in forces being applied to joints on different sides. Roof trusses, the, the forces are typically applied on the joints on the top and bridge trusses on the bottom, but same thing. Uh, when you talk about designing a truss, right, what kind of uh, engineering decisions do you have to make? Well, you can probably imagine that the underlying geometry uh, is, uh, follows best practices, like you're not going to, to go out and do a new geometrical layout from scratch unless you have some type of very unique uh, situation in which your geometry is highly constrained. So what really the fundamental aspect of truss design comes down to is actually choosing what material to use for your members. So if you're using wood, is a two by four going to be sufficient? Are you going to have to go to something that has a little more cross-sectional area? If you're using metal, uh, same type of decisions, basically how much integrity, structural integrity, do the members of the truss have to have in order to be able to suit your particular anticipated loading conditions? So that's why we're doing this type of analysis in this class. We want to find out whether these trusses are in tension or compression, and we need to know uh, how much force is associated with either the tension or compression in order to determine how big to make the particular members. So when we actually analyze trusses in this class, even though this is a very real practical thing, as I've tried to emphasize in the last two slides, it's going to feel very simple. And the underlying mathematics is very simple. And that comes from 
the uh, simplifying assumptions that we will use in our analysis. So if in a truss, we assume that all of the forces are applied at a joint, which means we're gonna ignore the weight, because if you think about it, um, if these were uniform cross-section members, they would have a weight, each little chunk will have a weight, but we could model that weight as being a single weight vector applied at the centroid or center of gravity of the object. That wouldn't be at the joint though. So we're just going to ignore that for, for the time being and say that all of the loading in a truss including the weight of the individual members is applied at the joints. And what that will mean is that F at each of our joints, uh, looking up here in the right for an actual interconnection that we would see in the real world, something like a gusset plate. If all of the members, the lines of actions are just axes that you would draw along the center of each uh, intersect at a given point, that means that the forces are concurrent. So we can kind of go to a particle model back to what we were talking about in chapter three. And what that will mean is that each of these members is just going to be what we introduced in the last chapter, a two force member. So in order for each, if the entire truss is in equilibrium, each member is in equilibrium. And if each member is a two force member, that means that on each side of the members, we're either pulling in opposite directions, which is the case in the lower left here, where we would say that the member is in tension. Now remember kind of a lot of the examples that I did earlier in the course when I would draw on the dot cam, if a member is in tension by Newton's third law, that member is actually pulling on the pin. Uh, the alternative scenario would be that the member is in compression, meaning that the pins are pushing down on both sides and tending to compress the member. In that scenario, the member is pushing up on the pin. Remember Newton's third law, equal and opposite reaction forces. So what is a simple truss? Well, the book just defines a simple truss as anything that you can build up by adding individual members to the basic triangular structure that you see on the right. So just know that definition when you're reading through. Um, it just basically means something that can be analyzed relatively easily using the two techniques that we're going to discuss uh, in the remaining learning modules. So uh, I'm going to contradict myself a bit here, uh, not because I want to, but because the book does. We, again, want to take on analysis techniques that work the same way every time and let the math um, kind of do the work for us. That way we don't have to have a lot of physical intuition when we actually build our basic models, which initially will be free body diagrams of the individual joints. However, it is good to build some physical intuition as mechanical engineers, or even if you're on the electrical side and you're not going to be using this much in order to determine uh, whether individual members are in tension and compression. So if you look up here in the upper right, we'll see in the next learning module, but the way that the method of joints works is it basically says that if this entire truss is in equilibrium, then each member is in equilibrium along with each joint. So if you notice at joint B, there's a 500 Newton force applied in the right horizontal direction. So if you think about the nature of the two members which are attached at point B, only member BC is going to be capable of exerting a force on pin B that has any horizontal component. Because if you notice, member BA is a range purely vertical. Remember that when you have these two force members, their forces that they exert on the pins are gonna be directed along the actual axis of the member itself. So all that BA can do, the member, with respect to the pin at B, is if it is in tension, it can pull it down, or if it's in compression, it can push it up, but it can't do anything to move pin B left or right. So that responsibility will all be on member BC. So if you think about it, if you need to counteract a applied 500 Newton force to the right, you would need member BC to push up on the pin at the direction defined by its geometry, such that at least a component is going to tend to push the pin to the left. Well, if the member is pushing the pin to the left, the pin is pushing the member to the right. So long story short, you can see that member BC, in order to counterbalance this right 500 Newton force, has to be in compression. It is in compression, so the pin pushes in on the member, meaning that the member pushes out on the pin. And that force directed along the line of action of BC will have a component that goes to the left, which can counteract this 500 Newton force. Along that same logic, if you think about it, if member BC is compression in, is in compression and it's exerting a pushing force upon BC, that will have a component to the left, which counterbalances the 500 Newton force, but it will also have a component up that's going to tend to push that pin B up. The only way 
that that pin can remain in equilibrium is if member BA pulls the pin down. So the logic here works. BC has to be in compression in order to overcome the 500 Newton force to the right. If BC is compression, in compression, it will not only be pushing bin, pin B to the left by its X component, it will be pushing it up by its Y component. In order for pin B to remain stationary, member AB has to pull it back down. So member AB will actually be in tension. So that's what we mean by doing kind of a manual inspection of a particular pin in order to determine whether the members are in tension or compression. And that's all this is showing you here. If you need this pin to be in equilibrium, the direction of the force that member BC exerts on B has to be going upwards and to the left by Newton's law. If the member pushes that way on B, the pin pushes that back way on the member, so it's in compression. This will allow you to counterbalance 500 Newtons to the right. Now you have to counterbalance the Y component, which is going up, which you do by having member BB, BA, pull the pin down and it's intention. So a lot, probably pretty hard to follow because I was saying a lot of words there and I'm sure that many of you likely zoned out uh, beforehand, but uh, the good news is we're not actually going to do that when we do the formal analysis techniques. Instead, we're just going to develop a single convention that we will assume all of our members are intention. We'll do the math and if it turns out we were wrong, we'll just get negative signs. So hopefully that was a good introduction to chapter six. Chapter six is mainly about trusses. There is a little bit about machines that we'll look at uh, a little bit later and what, I'll probably do another theoretical learning module uh, later on here. But I wanted to get this posted because at least on uh, exam two uh, from chapter six, you will only be analyzing trusses.